All right, this is Rick. This is uh, the fourth video in a three video series. Oh, that doesn't make sense. Uh, it was gonna be three videos and I ended up having to make four because the scripts are take too long and I didn't want to bore you to death. So this is the fourth video in the third, in the three video series. All right, so this is LHD recovery and this is the rec penetration scripts. Um, we start off in an SDV. In this case, it's called SDV1. And the SDV is attached to sub one with the X, Y, and Z offsets. And uh, direction is set to the same direction as sub one. And the engine is switched on. So now this is the HMS Proteus. If I can find this in the asset browser. It's in the structures alters seaport. HMS Proteus. Now, if you look at the config on this particular vehicle, you'll see that it's a floating object, floating structure, F, which means it's positively buoyant, which is a kind of a drawback because if you attach the SDV to the sub, and the mission is supposed to start underwater. In a very few, in a few seconds, this sub is going to float to the surface, and it's going to kind of defeat the point. So, there are two ways of preventing that happening. One is, um, well, there's one better way of doing it. And the first way is to disable the simulation on the the sub. But that's the problem with that is that once your object is attached to the disabled simulation, then the simulation on this object becomes disabled and then you are locked in a, you can't look sideways and you're physically locked in, in position. The better way of doing it is to spawn, uh, or is to drop in a helipad, invisible helipad, and position it exactly where you want the sub to, position, to be positioned. Attach the sub to the helipad that will lock the sub into position. Then you can attach the SDV to the sub without any problem. Um, okay, so in this case, it's uh, the, the sub, uh, the helipad is called pad one, as you can see. And um, we're now going to attach, we're gonna attach the SDV to, to, the, um, to the sub. So if you look at a script, um, we have some add actions attached uh, or added to the sub. The first, well, the first command is sub one attached to, to pad one, which is the helicopter pad and the vertical offset of 10. The next command or the next process involves adding an action to the sub, which allows you to attach the SDV. Now, if you bring the SDV in to more or less where it's in, is initially positioned this prompt will come up and you'll be able to and it will automatically attach you to the sub the process will be fairly uh, sudden it's not really ideal but I mean there is a way at least there is a way of attaching to the sub I think uh, you could probably evolve it just a little bit by putting some lights on the back of the sub but in any event we we've added a, an attach uh, option to the sub and then we add a detach option as well uh, in both cases sub one is the is this select zero in other words the object that the add action is placed on and it checks to see if the vehicle player is a kind of SDV in both cases and the distance to the sub one is less than 15 then it does the following checks the vehicle player attached to sub one sets the uh, y and z offsets y is your sort of horizontal offset and that's your vertical offset and it says vehicle player set direction direction sub minus 180 so it, re it reverses the direction so that you're facing in the direction the sub is facing and then it plays a sound called detach strangely enough it remote execs it so that everyone can hear the sound across the network if they're in the, within a certain radius of this object. And then uh, if vehicle X uh, equals sub 1, then uh, action eject vehicle player for each unit's group player. 
Okay, then on the detach SDV, we've got uh, again, the same thing, sub one, so this select zero, the object that the add action is attached to, checks to see whether the player vehicle is a type of SDV and it's attached to the sub. If so, then it detaches the vehicle player, plays the sound detach, sleeps for two seconds, and then it runs a loop from one to five, step 0 0.1 vehicle player set vertical velocity and essentially moves the velocity from one to five meters per second and moves it up sleeps for a short period of time so the the stv lifts off the back of the submarine all right so that's how we started the mission if you haven't watched the video i should actually go and watch it because otherwise it's not going to make much sense Okay, so the next thing is the the uh, LHD. The LHD is under structures, boats, landing, helicopter, dock, uh, wasp class, empty. Um, now, obviously, because it's a sunken uh, aircraft carrier, we need to dress it up a bit and make it look like it's kind of been under the water for a while. So, uh, sink it into the sand, and then add some some plants all over the deck and um, in order to do that I'm, I've made as you can see uh, a lot of using a lot of logics and the logics basically uh, allow you to position uh, objects in three-dimensional space by just moving the logic to a specific position so in the logic um, I run a, a script which allows me to dump a whole lot of plants around the position of the logic now in this case, uh, this I'm going to show you this little script in the uh, script editor. Uh, where is it? Rick vegetation. So this is what's in each of the logics. It's not exactly the same as this, but uh, you get the gist from this. So it takes the position of the logic, stores it in pos as a local variable. Then it then generates a, an array of plants. Um, and there are a number of plants that I've been through and I'm, there's coral one to five and uh, I didn't like four so I left that out. Seaweed, two lots of seaweed, brain coral, coral, SPS pink, I think that's staghorn coral pink. And then there's uh, two urchins, a black and a red. Then there's a green staghorn coral, then there's a starfish, then there's this bush. Um, the bush, whoops, the bush objects are collections of many of those things. The uh, problem with some of them is that they're out of uh, vertical alignment. So when you drop them down, you find some are floating up, up above the ground and it's a tedious process to, to, to align them properly. So, uh, I'm not a big fan of some of these. Anyway, so I choose a, a create an array. If you look back on this, see the weeds array. Here's the array of weeds, and they have the specific um, pathing, actual pathing to the weed to the actual folder. So you see, like there's a thistle thorn green, and so on. So there's all these different things, and I've increased the number of some some objects. I'd like to drop down more often. It's going to randomize, uh, random select from this this group of uh, in the array. So I've got like in this case three staghorn green corals that I've dumped in to increase the probability that that will, one of those will be in almost every single um, logics area. Then in this particular case, I've gone, for, I've run a loop uh, from zero to fourteen. So it's going to choose fourteen bushes or plants from f randomly from the from the weeds the array of weeds it's then going to find a random position within four meters of the position of the logic and it's going to create a symbol a simple object the weed is going to be created and it's going to create it at the position the random position that was chosen and it's going to convert that random position from above the ground level to above sea level. I'll use that because it seems to give me a better 
or more precise positioning on the deck of the carrier. Then I set the plants direction to random. You want random looking plants. You want them all to look exactly the same. Um, then it positions the plant um, using getpods ATL. Um, and uh, I found that it, that seemed to help. Um, it doesn't kind of make sense, but uh, so we already created the created the plant at that position. But by replacing it by sometimes by repositioning it after it's being created, it seems to align more correctly. Anyway, so every single one of these uh, logics is uh, creating plants. Now, obviously, it's going to make me go blind more than likely. But uh, cause it's really difficult to see exactly where these damn things are. So especially when you've got so many. So now if you see these guys are not moving, well, you know that these guys are all on the level that I'm working on now. So in this particular case, I've got an, a radius of four and 14. So there'll be 14 plants within a, a four meter radius of that position. And in this particular position, uh, only gonna be four in a radius of 1.3. So in this way, you can go and you can do kind of relatively small areas by just adjusting these two values. It's quite useful because it does a lot of the work for you. And obviously you don't want uh, a really big radius. Uh, otherwise you have plants sort of sticking out in the middle of the sea. Um, okay, so that's how I dressed up the aircraft carrier deck and the cargo holds and so on. Next thing is the welding system. Uh, if you notice, we've got two guys here. These are the welders. This is welder and welder two. And this particular object here is a torque wrench. The torque wrench has got to be attached to this guy so that it looks like he's using it to do some welding. It's the nearest thing I could get. It's not really probably ideal, but at least in the absence of a mod, this will do. And uh, it's kind of got a nozzle, so it looks kind of like it's maybe doing something. In order to get it to to attach this correctly to this guy, this guy I have disabled his animation, and I switch move him into a into this at animation because this is a static. I mean, he's these two guys are welding non-stop throughout the whole demo sequence. You don't really expect them to stop and move somewhere else. They do periodically stop and then carry on, but they essentially are static in position. So. They switch move into into a, a phys, into a, a freestanding position under the water where they're moving their feet and floating, uh, with their arms stuck out as if they've got guns in them. The one has got a gun. This guy doesn't have a gun. And then what I do is I attach the rod, which is this guy called a rod, uh, a rod attached to welder. At the x y and z offsets took quite a while to get this positioning correct and then i use a mem point of right hand middle one so and rod is going to be attached to that position or these offsets and then rod set vector direction and up that just changes the orientation of this object so if i now that, remember this is daytime, so we're gonna unfortunately the limitation of the engine is that lights are all switched off during the day, which is actually a serious problem in my opinion. Um, there are a number of reasons why you need to have lights on during the day. Uh, for example, there could be a sandstorm, and you could barely see through the. It could be get really dark, and you need your lights on so that not just to be able to see, but also to help other vehicles see you. You're underwater. It's really dark. Uh, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. As you probably noticed, um, long wavelength light, uh, such as red light, which has a lower energy level, gets filtered out at uh, relatively shallow depths under sea, under the water. So when you get to about 10 or 15 meters, red disappears completely as a color. And so the, the Arma 3 engine is actually really very good when it comes to replicating that because if you watched the previous video uh, on the LHD recovery, you'll notice when I got attacked by the shark, uh, I think around 12 minutes into the, into the video, um, the blood is, is a dark sort of uh, almost black. 
until you shine your light on it and then uh, you see the bright red. So it's very realistically done. So as a consequence of this, you need light during the day. And that's a engine limitation. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do. So consequently, when you, if you were to view this now, which we will do, you'll notice that it doesn't really look that impressive because you're obviously not going to see the, the, the light point that's attached to the end of the rod. You're not going to see the particle effects of the sparks and so on. So it's rather limiting. Welding team is working on the west side, silent door. So you can see that the actual position of the hands is pretty good. I mean, he looks like he's holding it. Uh, sure, you, you know, we know now that that actually is a torque wrench and that doesn't make sense. But, but most people will just look at him and think, okay, oh, well, he looks like he's doing some sort of welding. It's not perfect. And I'm not quite sure why the particles or why those sparks are being you know, are offset to the extent that they seem to be. Anyway, so I'll get into the scripts just now to show you how that process was done. Next thing is we're going to go down, we're going to look at the movement of bodies in water so that they, they float. Actually, while I'm at it, let me show you what this looks like when, uh, when it's dark. Currently the time is 5 past 12. So I'm going to skip time to seven by seven and a half hours. Okay. That's a little better. Three D sound. Okay. So I'm just gonna set the time back to where it was. All right, the next thing is dead bodies. You've got to have a few dead bodies, especially since the story on the LHD recovery is that they finally located the actual wreck, but they can't quite figure out why everyone's dead. Now the script, the movement, water movement script allows you to do this sort of thing. It can rotate any object in a in, um, submerged environment. You could also use it for like a space simulation. Uh, it could be quite cool to visualize dead bodies floating around. It's a bit macabre, but anyway. Essentially what this does is it picks the initial starting point and, and the direction of the object. And it picks another position, let's say in this case five meters away, and then it moves that object, moves the object very slowly to into the to the position of the second position. Then it moves it back to the original position. Uh, in the process, it rotates the object using set the set um, direction and up, and. Um, it changes the pitch, yaw, and roll of the object as it moves. And as I said, this is quite useful because you can use it on boxes and any, any object that you want to float uh, or to move around sort of in a natural sort of floating way. So now we're going to move, now we're going to move downstairs. You might have wondered how did how did I know I was going down the stairs or going down this ramp? Well, you see, there's a little book over here, and um, that book is actually um, placed so that I know that I can use that as a marker because it's detecting my distance from it. Because I, it's very difficult to detect my position from this position in the LHD. Anyway, so that played a 3D sound. The fact that someone could actually pick it up is a bit of a drawback, but by the time you get close enough, it would have played, so it wouldn't have made, it, made any difference. All right, so now we're down in the hangar, and as, as you would expect, uh, it's a nice and ambient sound playing. Very 
place. There is some boxes that are statics on the ceiling. And there's this box that's floating around. Very smooth moving. And I think it's quite natural because it looks like the currents stop that gradually moving it around and you can see that it's it's not jerky or anything okay so the thing we're actually interested in is in fact these boxes over here because behind there is a shark a great white shark and if you watch the previous video he said for the fourth time you will have noticed that um, the sharks, if I get close enough to them, then the shark is triggered. Currently the shark's sitting in a disabled simulation mode. And when I, I've got a trigger that's sitting there monitoring my distance to one of these boxes, in fact the bottom box, say eight boxes. And uh, if I get close enough, then it will activate uh, a move box script, which will basically burst the boxes out towards me in both directions. processes that were involved in this. I'm going to show you the scripts now, how that was put together. Alright, let's first look at the welding script. Um, I started that off in the init.sqf file. Uh, it passes the name of the welder and the rod that he's holding to the script. If I look at the script, welder is picked up through this select zero and rod is picked up through this select one. And then spawns us into um, or runs us in the unscheduled environment and passes these variables to um, into this environment. It sleeps for one to five, one to six seconds. It sets a couple of variables, distance 0 0.8 and, and y0, creates a light point at the position of the rod with a light brightness of 0, so in other words you can't see it. It sets the light color to, uh, to slightly yellow and attaches the light to the rod at the distance of 0 0.8 and uh, Y offset of 0 and Z offset of 0. Then it runs a loop and while the welder is alive, it sleeps for half a second, it creates a smoke uh, particle source at the position of the rod, it attaches the smoke to the rod and it sets um, the particle class for the smoke is avionic smoke, which is really nice. It's that very small little puff of smoke. And it then gets the position of the smoke and it modifies that very slightly to, for the spark position. In this case, it creates six sparks. They're not very impressive. They're avionic sparks and so they're not supposed to be really big couldn't find a better looking spark which is unfortunate so I created six of them and I positioned them all in more or less the same position. I spawned the light that we previously created and I set the light brightness and I vary the light brightness to create the effect that the light is flickering. So you see the light brightness is adjusted from 0 0.7 to 1 which is full bright and the color is slightly adjusted as well from just under pure white to slightly yellow, so white to yellow. And it sleeps for 0.1 to 0.3 seconds, and then it sets the brightness to zero. So it keeps doing this while this loop is ca taking place, so that the light flickers uh, to give it an effect of welding. And then there are two sound files, welding one and welding two, and it selects one of them randomly in, and puts it into a, a local variable called sound, and then it Say, say 3D, it plays that in 3D sound on the welder and the player is the target. And it does this for 10 seconds and then when after 10 seconds it deletes all the sparks and deletes the smoke. 
that sleeps for up to four seconds from one to four seconds and then it completes it really does the loop in the event that the uh, welder is chomped by a shark or killed by whatever then the light is deleted in case the light still existed and then it exits the loop so that's how the welding system works okay the next thing is the water movement To make a movement, to make an object move in the water, you just simply run the script on the object. Just drop this command into the object. And um, if it was obviously if it's running on a server, it, 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 it exits, it picks up this as this select zero. So it picks up the object that this is being run on, dead body or box or whatever. It then uses a constant. This is the amount of movement or the distance that each incremental uh, time slice the object will move. The distance that it will move back and forwards because it moves between two points. Max distance 5 meters. I'm not using this animate distance yet. Uh, this could be used to only trigger the movement when I'm within a certain range. But I actually found that uh, the impact of this script is very little on the... Uh, on the overall performance of the game so I left it running even though there may be I think something like 30 or 40 objects that are all moving running on the script anyway and then it takes the, gets the direction of the object uh, and it uses the direction in in the uh, your pitch and, and roll settings so it uses the direction for the your setting Pitch is set to 1 and uh, roll is set to 0.5 and the sleep value is 0.001. And it gets the initial position of the object, in this case the dead body or box, and then it runs this loop. And there are two loops or sub loops in this. The first is moving from the current position to the position that it selects randomly at a distance and direction from the, the position. On the initial position and then moving back to its original position so in this case it finds a relative position based on the initial position of the body or box um, based on the increment which in this case will be the increment plus the constant and the constant as i said was a very small amount so it finds a position that's 0 0.003 meters away in the direction of the current from the, from the current position and then basically it moves the object to that position it then uses this command over here or this instruction to set vector direction and up to adjust the pitch yaw and roll of the object very subtly very small movement incrementally for each time that it runs it's only moving at a fraction of a few millimeters each time so that it creates a very smooth movement if you want to know more about this process then um, go and have a look under set vector direction and up on the biz uh, wiki and it'll tell you a little bit more about this but you can get pretty accurate adjustments from a two-dimensional space into a three-dimensional space using using this formula and um, uh, as you can see it works pretty well so that's moving away from this current right in the beginning from its current position and from its car then from the new position back to its current position it does the reverse and then as a variation on that is the box movement where we saw the shark knock the boxes out the way anyway it creates an array of boxes in this particular case there were eight boxes if you remember at the door uh, it then counts the number of boxes and then it creates some um, empty arrays box positions box directions box distances and then uh, individual box pars box direction is set to zero and new pars is an empty array that seeps for a second and then for each of the boxes it says get the current box position of magic variable x in other words box in this case box one so we're working through this array of boxes so box pars get the position of box 
one okay and then push that box position into an array called box positions it pushes it into that array and it does it for each of those boxes so now we have box positions made up of the box position for each of these boxes stored in box positions and then the box direction we do exactly the same thing we get the direction of the shark we add uh, 90 degrees and subtract a random 180 so that basically means get the direction of the shark plus 90 or minus 90 degrees so the box direction could be in any a random position in any one of those directions so long as it moves out of the way of the central position in other words the direction that the shark is facing and then it pushes that direction into the box direction so we end up with a list of box directions for each of the boxes hopefully they're all kind of random or well, they will be the box distance is is actually at this point uh, a fixed distance but i was considering using different distances for each box because you're facing the shark and you're getting attacked and the boxes are kind of moving out of your way you don't and it's night time you don't notice that the boxes actually disappear into the distance and actually get deleted or they just disappear um, it was the simplest method rather than trying to slow them down because of reduced velocity because of the water that it's moving through and trying to create some sort of simulation of physics because it's super complex to do that. So the next thing is it runs a loop from zero to the number of boxes minus one because it's a zero base array. So in other words, from zero to seven. And then what it does is it passes I boxes, box direction and the box distances and it puts it into the non-scheduled environment so we can run all of these in, in sequence. It passes these object these variables into uh, the non-scheduled environment using the params command and then for each because this is a loop for each box it selects i in other words the first the first loop on this or iteration on this on this loop will be where i is zero and so it will say box boxes of of boxes select i select the first box in the boxes array direction select the first direction in the directions array and first and select the first distance in the distances array box distances so now we have the first box we've got its direction and its distance and we then we know what the um your pitch and roll is we've got fixed amounts for those and now we run a, another loop from zero to distance, step 0 0.01. So it's like a really small movement. And we add one to the pitch, add five to the roll. And then we move the, the object very, very subtly and rotate it according to these settings. It gets a new position based on the current position, the increment and the direction. And that direction, that new position, the box is then moved to that position. And then there's a minute uh, amount of time or delay. It sleeps for that time and then it reloops. And then once it's done this and completed the distance, gets to the distance, it then deletes bubbles, which are positioned just behind the box wall to create the sense that when the boxes are disturbed, there's some trapped air inside them and they come out. And then it deletes all the boxes. You're not aware of the fact that it's being done because, uh, as I said, you're more concerned about keeping your legs and arms intact and maybe your life. So now, so those are the two uh, water movement and the box move. Diver light's very simple. It's really just an add action on the, on the diver and gives a diver light on and off so you can toggle it. So the unit is this select one. So it's the person that triggered the add action. The uniform is the uniform that the unit's wearing, in other words, the uniform of the player, and the position is the position of the player. And then it says if the uniform that the player is wearing is in this array, in other words, he's wearing a wetsuit, and the light's not on, this is a variable that I defined in uh, init.sq, then do the following. Create a light point at the position of the player. Set the ambient light to zero. Set the light color to slightly yellow. Set the light attenuation to uh, 
to one on the x-axis set the light intensity to two set the light direction to the direction the unit's facing and then attach the light object slightly above it and in front of it so it looks like he's got a light it's more for practical purposes and visibility purposes to have a diver light you'd obviously need to have a, a mod uh, where you have an object that's emitting light and so on then it switches the variable to true and it hints that the underwater light's on else if one of these conditions or this condition is not true in other words the light is on and he's wearing a wetsuit then delete the light, set the light to false, and say, okay, the light is now off. So it allows you to toggle the light on and off. Next thing was very simple, which was uh, triggering the sound on the LHD. And in order to do that, I created a trigger. If I can just find the LHD, here it is. Now the question is, where is the trigger? There it is. The trigger is 6.9 meters in height, so it's from the ground to just below the deck height. And I don't want the sound to start up before the player has actually essentially gone in through the doors and, and so on. It's pretty eerie sound effects, especially at, at night time. I already discussed the vegetation process. So essentially that's how it works. And uh, I think there's some useful features in here that if you're making Armour 3 missions, you could find some of this stuff useful. I've also created lots of little bubbles, effects around the, to dress it up, to make it look a little bit more realistic. Put some camping lights down on the terrain to make it look more interesting. I've put down a, a broken trawler over here. I put down a number of cat shark and various different types of sharks. Uh, THA sharks and faint sharks which was yeah the apex species by faint which is really good anyway i hope that was of use and um please subscribe and thank you for watching cheers